Welcome to Radio Baladi, the first Arab, Middle Eastern, and American simulcast radio show. Radio Baladi is broadcast every Friday morning on WNZK 690 AM from 8 until 9 Eastern Time on Des Moines, Michigan with Layla Alvin Our call in number 248 248- Five five seven thirty three hundred. And now, stay tuned for the best radio talk show on Arab and American issues with your host Layla Al Hussein. <laughs> I am Asif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Good morning. The coronavirus is a global threat not only to human health and lives, but also to the economy and well-being of people everywhere. In the U.S., more than 30 million people have claimed unemployment benefits so far. In China, growth is declining by 7% for the first time in 50 years. Oil prices are down as people are locked down and businesses are closed. Yes, fewer cars on the road are resulting in cleaner air. But the uncertainty about the end of the pandemic leaves us with an air of uncertainty about where we are heading. To discuss the impact of the coronavirus on the global economy and our well-being, we have a group of distinguished guests and experts. From Washington, Dr. Mohammed Rabia, Professor of International Political Economy. From Michigan, journalist Khalil Hashim, who is the founder and executive editor of bizmagazine.org. And from Washington, Dr. Nabil al who is a researcher and academic and a professor of international business strategies at Virginia International University. My first question, good morning, gentlemen, is for all three of you. I know it's a tough question, but I have to hear from each one of you. And let's start with Dr. Rabia. Should we, under those circumstances, be saving lives or saving jobs? Dr. Rabia. Of course, saving lives, not saving jobs. Because jobs are for people. And if we are having no people, then we have no jobs and we have no economy. Any economy in the world is designed to serve the people, not the people serving the economy. Because there is no economy without people and there are no people without economy. The relationship between them is a dynamic one. Each party affects and is affected by the other party. So priority has to come to the people. You save their lives, and if they, if they are healthy, then they'll be able to produce, and we will have a better economy and a better society. Okay, so my next question for you, Dr. Rabia, will come later, and it will be about, uh, obviously, you sound like you are opposed to lifting the restrictions of uh, social distancing, but let me ask you the same question first to Mr. Hashim. Uh, good morning, and, and hope you're all safe uh, and, and happy Ramadan. Um, definitely, it is a balance. I mean, we want first to focus on people at the same time 
there are some areas where we can still do some business while observing the uh, uh, you know the measures that put in place. Uh, the virus is with us for a long time. This is not a brief uh, uh, you know it's not a brief issue. It's not going to end in a month or two. We may have and we will have about two in the fall, and we can't just keep locking down everything for a year or so. And it's not about, you know, the overall general economy. It's about the livelihood of everyone. And there are several businesses that can, you know, that can operate while observing the social distancing, while wearing masks, while, you know, uh, following all the CDC guidelines. So you're going to have to learn to operate with this virus. And there's a lot, to, you know, to, for us to know about this virus. It seems to that we still don't have a lot of information about it. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. Uh, you know, first they told us that uh, it affected elderly and, and those who are sick. And then we start seeing young people, athletes, uh, and so forth and so on getting, you know, get, uh, dying. So we really, there's a lot we don't know. And then we have to figure out a way how we can adapt and live with this virus. We can't just, I mean, right now we need to, Stay where we are and we need to observe all the guidelines, but at the same time, we have to find a way to live with the virus. Dr. Nabil al Azari, should we be saving lives or saving jobs right now, given the circumstances we have? Hi, let me say hi first to you and to your uh, audience. Actually, this is a very difficult balance with two important factors. You cannot you can save jobs if life is still under threatening you. And you have to have an idea about much, how much your system is strong to, and, and the capacity of the system is enough to recover. If we combine a system level of strength with the an assessment of the intensity of the of virus transmission, we can evaluate any region readiness to start to restart activity. And in this case, you know, you can reopen the, the economy. Well, my next question is for uh, Dr. Rabia, as I said. Um, Dr. Rabia, you talked initially about the priority to saving lives rather than saving jobs. So my question for you is, I suppose you are opposed to what the governors are doing, lifting or easing the restrictions uh, for uh, social distancing. Well, I would say that it's too early. I am not against it because we have to open the economy step by step, but I think it's a little bit too early. Uh, but I would like to add to this, is that I have made an observation, which I hope I'll be proving right, is that uh, the uh, virus is becoming weaker than it has been before, because the cases are increasing, but the number of people who are requiring hospitalization is not increasing by, uh, by as much. And this really means that there is something in the dynamics of the, this virus. It, I asked a scientist who is a colleague of mine, and he told me that the virus there is random mutation that produces new strains. It seems that the strain that is being produced is weaker than the one before. And this is, is the only hope that we have that we have not, we, that we will not have a new wave later on in September, and that continues. Then the virus will become just like the, the flu virus, and people can live with it and can go back, get back outside and function. But at this time, we really don't know, just like Mr. Uh, Halila said, exactly what is happening with the virus. So I think we have to wait a little bit. If we continue in America, uh, the rate of increase in the testing, we should know within six weeks exactly where we stand. But not right now, because all what we have today 
is less than 2% of the population has been tested. And that is very, very small, you know, percentage. So we need to increase this by at least 5 or 6%. Then we'll have a better picture. And at the same time, we'll be able to know what happens in New York. New York, for example, is the first case. It has more people who died there and who are infected there. Next to it is New Jersey. New Jersey, the percentage of the people who are infected among those who are tested is about 45%, which is very high. In America as a whole, it's 17%. But despite this high percentage in New Jersey, the number of people who are requiring hospitalization is not increasing by much. So there is a trend, and I hope that I'll be proving right and the uh, virus would be weakened and then come a safer time for all the economy to be open. Mr. Hashim, you talked a minute ago about the importance of striking a balance between um, saving jobs and saving lives. Now, my question for you is that, as you know, millions of people have risen out of poverty in, in recent years. Now the virus is pushing them back in, into poverty. So how do we deal with that problem? Well, you know the property issue. The property issue has been around for some time, and, uh, and you know recently, in the past four years. Now we're talking about America. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, in America. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, although the economy is good in the past four years, it has benefited the well-to-do and 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 the connected, and it has shrunk the middle class. And uh, uh, so, you know, the fact that, you know, poor people have been doing better really is not 100%. Uh, uh, the numbers really don't support that. So more and more, um, the economy was doing well for Wall Street, for not for Main Street. However, we've had one of the lowest unemployment numbers in years, which is really good. But wages did not increase. Right now, with the government helping the the everybody who is unemployed right now, and it is a brief you know brief period where it's going to take three months or four months or five months. Hopefully, when they return and uh, and and open up, this will change. Some people today are making more money on unemployment that than when they were making working you know a minimum wages. Uh, some of these people may not come back. Now, the, the current situation is going to change the economy. Some small businesses are, may not continue, and some people may change the way that they've been doing business. And then, you know, as you see right now, some restaurants are providing uh, carry out. We have new surge of businesses of delivery. So things are going to change. Things are going to adapt. Now, what the government needs to do to help, you know, the, the alleviate the poverty that may come, you know, may come up as a result of this is to provide opportunities and then to continue helping with loans and continue helping with asking banks to give, you know, continue the breaks that, have, that, that they have provided for consumers. You know, today you don't have to pay your mortgage, you don't have to pay your credit cards, you don't have to pay anything. And now, after three months, what's going to happen? Are you going to have to pay it all at once, or are you going to be? Are they, you know, are they going to put it with the rest of the money, and then you can start over, so you won't be as impacted as you know having the burden having to pay it all at once. Uh, if we do it correctly, then we can help. The poor, you know, the poor and the needy. But if you don't do it correctly, we, we may be looking at a huge issue with the economy. Now, the other issue is that, uh, uh, that makes this all complicated is the testing. And we, you know, I mean, the best way to, to deal with this virus is to test everybody, find out who has it, isolate them within four weeks, three weeks, and then you're okay. But we're not doing that. So now we'll stay home. And then after four, five, six weeks, we'll go out and then numbers go up. Then we'll go back in. So unless we have this policy of testing everybody, trying to know who has it, who doesn't, and then know what to deal with, you know, this is really, I just see it going nowhere. We'll continue after the break.
Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab offers a great array of your favorite Mediterranean meals. Meals range from lamb specialties, shawarma sandwiches, seafood dinners, and they offer special big trays of your favorite food, plus much more. Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab address is 32839 Northwestern Highway in Farmington Hills. Their phone number is 248-538-9552. That number again is 248-538-9552, and the supermarket is open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab will definitely leave you satisfied. When it comes to reproductive medicine, IVF Michigan Fertility Centers are the recognized leaders. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and five other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. As a founding member of IVF Michigan Fertility Centers, Dr. Nicholas Shama is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. Dr. Shama has performed over 10,000 IVF cases and has helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. American board certified in both of obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, Dr. Nicholas Shama is a very caring, compassionate, expert physician that understands not only the medical but also the emotional toil of infertility on his patients. When it's time, get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio. Call toll-free 855-952-9600, 855-952-9600. Hi, I'm Asif Abdel Jalal. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK, 690 a.m and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to Radio Valley. We are discussing the impact of the coronavirus on the economy and on our well-being. The first part, we're going to focus on the impact here in the U.S., but then we... A little later, we'll talk about the impact in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Rabia, uh, governors uh, in about 31 different states are easing restrictions. Um, So give me your predictions for those states where the restrictions might be lifted. I cannot really uh, talk much about those states because... First of all, they have the right to do it, but I think it's premature. And if this causes the cases of infected people to rise, then the impact will be negative rather than positive. But if they open in places where uh, people are not crowded in big cities and in rural areas and where uh, they can uh, guarantee the safety of people, with, which we cannot guarantee at this time because every place is complaining that they don't have even uh, enough masks or other gear that they need to protect themselves and going on strike like at Amazon, then it's going to be a uh, negative impact. But the uh, overall, I don't think they'll see a growth uh, substantial enough to justify what they are doing because most people are scared. And as long as those people are receiving subsidies from the government, they are not going to be encouraged to go to work unless some people who don't believe that this is is dangerous from a safe safe point of view. Some people think that this is, you know, faith and whoever lives and dies is up to God and they will go. They take the risk and go. And that 
proved to be the wrong attitude, both in New York with the Jewish community and other places. Uh, also, it's not really the right path or the right position that people should take. So the, the, the impact on the economy is not going to be really great. We know that the American economy contracted by about 5% in the first quarter. And we have to understand this is actually in the last two weeks only of March, of, uh, of April, this because uh, of, of March, sorry. Because if you take all the months, the first quarter is three months, January, February, and March. And only the last two weeks that we have the impact, the closer. So which means in the last two weeks of March, the economy contracted by 5%, which is also it cancelled all the growth that happened in January and February and first two weeks of March. So the economy is contracting right now. And I think the second quarter, probably the contracting will be, in my estimate, closer to 30%, which will be a big, 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 you know, hit to the American economy. So there is justification, some justification to open the economy and let it go down that road. But again, the, the, the people who will be encouraged to go out will be small percentage because as long as they continue to receive subsidies, they will be taking care of themselves and they care about their health more than about the economy at this point. Mr. Hashim, um, those states who today begin easing the restrictions, uh, are they striking the right balance that you talked about? Uh, what are your predictions for those states? Well, some of these states, I think their decisions are based on affiliation with the White House and politics rather than uh, numbers and, uh, you know, and, and realities. Uh, you know, I think it's important, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier, which is the balance, but it would have to be done correctly and it has to be done in stages based on, you know, what businesses don't require the close proximity and what businesses could really uh, uh, abide by the CDC ruling. And if, for example, you know, some of the states that have meat back in plants and, uh, and, and some of the food chain uh, manufacturing there, uh, if they go back to work, which they did and then, then they got infected and then they went off and, and, and that's going to disrupt the supply chain. I, I think just like we have done for hospitals where we created a makeshift stations for people who are, infect, uh, who are infected by the uh, COVID-19, these plants and should work with the states in providing a makeshift manufacturing or uh, processing plants where we can observe the distancing, but at the same time we could produce to go back business as usual immediately without really uh, paying attention to the guidelines is not responsible in some of these states and they're going to have to pay for it. You know, if you take it, if you take a look at 1918, most of the people who died died in the second wave, not in the first wave. So, uh, and, and, and these, you know, these states again, they will could suffer consequences early in the fall or maybe sooner than that. You know, because if they reopen and reopen completely and they don't have a plan, we are where we are because we didn't have a plan. We didn't have a plan to counter the pandemic nationwide. We didn't have a plan for testing. We didn't have a plan for how we're going to deal with the economy except throwing money at it. So, again, we're not really going through the balance that I talked about. But we just gonna when we open, sort to make uh, the president happy is not really the right way to go. Let's uh, go uh, with that question to Dr. Rabia. Um, you said earlier, Dr. Rabia, that there is much we don't know about the virus, about the coronavirus, and that's actually what most experts are saying. But didn't we have? a coronavirus of some form or shape back in 2002 and striking China, the same place that coronavirus came from this time. So uh, how do you explain that we don't have 
a vaccine in 2019 when we had an idea about a similar form of virus in 2002-2003? Well, I think this question has to be asked to the government, not to me, uh, because uh, we understand also that there was some type, uh, some sort of cooperation between the United States and China in this area, and even some money from the U.S. went there to help finance the research in Wuhan. So, and then when President Trump came, he just closed the whole thing, and he had a unit, a medical unit that was stationed there to see what was going on. It has, I mean, it was established by the Obama administration, I guess. And then he canceled this and closed that account. Uh, so it is a responsible act that was taken by the administration here. And also, we know also they underestimated the seriousness of the virus at the beginning. That was the attitude. And we discovered later that the government was not ready for anything, was not ready uh, how to respond to the virus, how to deal with it. We didn't have this. We didn't have enough masks. We didn't have anything really that was uh, uh, good enough to face this challenge. And this is goes back to the free market economy, which I am again myself. I have been re writing about this for years and years and years. And I wrote a book after the, the first crisis, the uh, great recession, uh, recession, which we call it in 2008. I called it Saving Capitalism and Democracy, in which I said that the theory that you are using in economics, which I studied myself, and I taught at universities, different universities, is no longer valid. We have actually to reinvent our own theory and our own system, because the system is not fair. This system also is almost destroyed, disseminated the middle class in America. And although the number of poor people we are talking about is a small, something like 15%, I, I believe the actual number probably reaches 50, 30%, not 15%. And also when you talk about we had the lowest rate of uh, unemployment back in, uh, like, last year, this is not really correct. It's not accurate. It's, uh, it's put it differently. Because uh, participation in the labor force in America went down by about 6%. So if you take those people who pulled out of the market because they cannot find jobs, or they just went back, just like young people living with their families, and so on, then the rate actually was about 8%, not about only 4% or 3.8%. So when you lose people who get out of the market, and this was going to happen later on, by the way, I believe that a lot of people will pull out of the market because they are not going to find jobs. We'll have many, many thousands of bankruptcies we're going to have in the coming days. The, the debt of companies, American companies, about 19 trillion, which is almost the size of the economy after the, the contraction of the American economy. And there is so much junk bonds on the market. Yes, the Federal Reserve might buy these back and try to help, but the, 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 the bank is not, or the Federal Reserve, not going to be able to stop the bankruptcy. So many businesses are going to be out of business. Look at what's happening to the oil industry as, as an example. A lot of the small companies in Texas, Oklahoma, many different places, are going to go out of business. And when they close, there's no way to go back to that, that one. The Europeans were able to handle the situation much better than us. For example, in Germany and other countries, they, the government guaranteed 90% of the salaries of the people so companies can keep them and just pay 10% right now. In England, they did 80%. The government guaranteed 80%. So if the, when the economy, I mean, comes back, then people can go to the same jobs and the jobs will be available to them. And at the same time, companies will not pay 10% of what they were paying their worth. Here, we don't believe in this. So we're giving subsidies to the people directly, all right? And those people, some of them are getting more now than they were getting when they were working. And the, then when they come back, when companies go out of business, those people are not going to find jobs. So everything that everyone who claims that the economy will come back strong doesn't understand the economy and that does not understand the dynamics of our economy in particular. 
We'll continue after the break. Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Abood at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Abood now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and designs. The trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design. New location. 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Abood. 734-744-9796. If halal is important to your family, you can trust that Miramar will offer not only the highest quality halal products, but the best tasting and healthiest foods that can be placed on your family table with confidence. Miramar is the first and oldest halal certified food brand in America, serving the Arab and Muslim community and offers a wide range of halal food products. Check out Miramar's halal food selection today by visiting Miramar's exclusive distributor, Ziad Brothers Importing at www.ziad.com. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Iman Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Iman Nakash. See Dr. Iman Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248 336-3937, 336-3937, 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. I am Asif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East, live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK, 690 AM, and WDMV, 700 AM. Welcome back to Radio Baladi. We are discussing the impact of the coronavirus on the economy and on our well-being, both here in the U.S. And a little later, we will discuss that, the impact in the Middle East. Um, Mr. Hashim, um, President Trump says he has evidence the virus escaped from a Chinese institute in Wuhan, in the city of Wuhan. The intelligence community says we don't have evidence yet. Does that make you any comfortable? <laughs> Actually, nothing the president said makes me comfortable. Um, you know, I mean, you're making <laughs> allegations like that for political gain at this time. The president is trying to dodge his responsibilities of not acting correctly in regard to this virus. We've known about this virus since December, and then in, on January 3rd, uh, the uh, president's advisors told him that this can become a pandemic. This will leave China and come to the United States, come to the entire world. We need to be prepared. And he ignored it. First, he said it was a hoax. And second, he played it down. He said it's just like the flu. And then he dodged it out. And he rela- did not do what he needed to do. Even, even the governors in the states did not really take the matter seriously until later. And this, this is a, the issue with the virus that we're dealing with, and I'm not a medical expert, but from what I've gathered, it's highly infectious, and it's a new strain of the coronavirus because, you know, as you mentioned before, we've had different strains. Now, uh, you know, the problem with it is we still don't know much about it. We're still learning it, and, and, and had we done, done it correctly from day one, had the president, had the leadership to really immediately take measures and, and uh, uh, you know, th- I think this the impact would have been a lot less. Uh, it is here. To, the virus is here to stay. I, I really don't think that, uh, you know, there's any conspiracies there. Uh, these things happen. We've known about it. We've known it's going to happen. Uh, President uh, Bush, 
uh, second, the sum talked about it, talked about how pandemic we need to be prepared for and didn't do anything about it. President Obama talked about it and didn't do anything about it. You know, whether he was able to or not, that's a different story. President Trump had four years to really do something about it for us to be prepared for a pandemic. Instead of being prepared, you know, he, he really stripped the uh, uh, or cut the uh, budget for the CDC and specifically that department as part of their, you know, their cuts, and they didn't, really do, they didn't do anything. So we weren't really prepared, and I think the president, as we all know, the president, uh, you know, gives us uh, ideas without uh, backing it, you know, just like uh, the drinking of uh, uh, Lysol and other stuff that he suggested, and he later on said he was joking. And I, I don't think this has any water. It's just, uh, you know, uh, political uh, maneuvers to... Uh, misdirect the public and uh, and I don't think really it, it gained any traction. Dr. Robier, given what we heard from Mr. Hashim now about the performance of President Trump, and we are talking about the impact of the virus on the economy and on our all uh, well-being, but what impact will the virus have on President Trump's presidential aspirations? I think this is a key question, <laughs> Dr. Arthur. I think all what he's doing is just to get re-elected. And unfortunately, this is not a strategy. This is not even a sound plan to run a country, especially if you have a country like the United States that is still dominant in the world and maintains the strongest position, no matter what happens. And this is unfortunate. Unfortunate because the man is just driven by ambition to be there, sit in the White House for four more years, and he is willing to do anything that he could do if he can guarantee this kind of outcome. And this is why he is just accusing everybody, He's not only accusing uh, China and accusing other countries, but also he accused Russia before, and he accused Iran before, and everything. Because if you go back and look at the ruling elite in America, and this includes the, the, the Democrats, by the way, not only the Republicans, they are ruling this country by fear. This is actually taking a place since the Reagan administration. And when the people are fearful of an enemy from outside, then they are willing to, uh, like, abandon their, their, their rights or a portion of their rights. They accept a police state, they accept more violence, they accept uh, more unemployment, because there is a big, uh, uh, like, ghost is, is threatening them from outside. And as long as we have this ghost, we create it and we uh, push it and we inflate it, then they can be uh, comfortable in their feet. And this has been going on for over, uh, I mean, 50, uh, 30 years now. And that's not a strategy to rule the country. And uh, what uh, President Trump is trying to do is to get re-elected. So if the people in who are loyal to him believe, and, and it's easy for them to believe because they believe whatever he says, that if there's a threat from there and it's China, and now he's taking a strong position against China, then his chances will be better to be re-elected. And this is all what he's doing. He's strategy to get re-elected and doesn't care for the rest of the economy and the people. Mr. Hashem, let me jump now to the Middle East. In your opinion, rich or poor countries might suffer more. You have uh, for Saudi Arabia, for example, you have oil prices uh, plunging, and for a poor country like Egypt, Cairo is requesting a new loan from the IMF. You know, I think eventually poor countries, just like poor people, will ultimately pay the ultimate price. And uh, as the world is busy with itself, they're not going to bail out, uh, you know, other countries before bailing out their own, uh, you know, their own citizens and their own economy. Um, uh, uh, you know, the problem that we see in Lebanon, in in, uh, in uh, Egypt, in other places, um, this is going to be compounded. Uh, Saudi Arabia is rich, 
they have a lot of reserve. It depends on the duration of the economic crisis that we're dealing dealing with because of the coronavirus. If this duration is lengthening for several, for a couple of years, three years, it would affect them. You know, whether it is Dubai, whether it, whether it is, uh, you know, the Gulf states, enter the Gulf states. They have a large reserve of money. They can deal with what they're dealing with, you know, and they may have to delay some projects that they're working on and some wars they're fighting and so forth and so on. You know, because the best thing they do, these Gulf states, is kill each other than really a plan for the region as a region. As for Egypt and Lebanon and other places that are hanging in by a thread, they may see difficult times because, you know, look at the prices in, in, for food in Lebanon and right now with the, do, with the dollar reaching 4,000 lira, which is 4,000 Lebanese pounds, you know, and, and almost more than doubling. And who's going to pay for that is the poor. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's not going to be pretty for, for any of these countries. Dr. Rabia, um, how are the Palestinians managing the problem, given the fact that you have two different states in Palestine? You have uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, on the West Bank, and then you have the Hamas government in Gaza. Well, uh, the situation is more or less the same. The West Bank, the authority, the official the state government in Ramallah, is continuing the same policy as before. They have the limited income that comes. The Europeans continue to give the subsidies that they have been giving. As you know, the Americans have stopped this, or let's say President Trump has stopped this thing. And at the same time, they are getting also some of the fees that they are getting their the right from the Israelis that they pay on imports that come through the ports in Haifa and Jaffa and other places. And they continue, they don't have few, they have few cases. They, they acted uh, very fast and they were strict in uh, isolating people or, or forcing people to isolate themselves. So they have limited cases in the West Bank. So things are more or less close to the, what used to be. But the economy, they didn't have really much of an economy to start with. So some of the, some of the institutions are functioning, others are not functioning. It seems in Gaza has a different uh, impact because people start producing the masks. Now they are producing millions and hundreds of millions of masks that, and they are exporting them. So they find some kind of work to do over there, taking advantage of the corona. And also, the number of cases there are very, very limited in, in Gaza. So the, the situation is bad and continues to be bad. And there is poverty, both in the West Bank and also in Gaza. But it does not really deteriorate to the point of what uh, other people think is happening in Lebanon, and happening in Egypt and happening in uh, Sudan and other places. My fear is that we'll have there in the region a pandemic of starvation rather than a pandemic of corona. I think there is a starvation that's coming. In the Gulf, yes, as my colleague has said, they have reserves, but the, 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 those countries don't really produce much of anything. And therefore, all the jobs are dependent on the government. As long as the government is working, that means the jobs are there. But the, all their plans are going to be delayed. And if the prices of oil continue as they are today, they are going to be in trouble. The only one that will be safe is the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, because the population is too small to be affected with the, by the decline in the oil income. And also, Kuwait, in a way, is in between. But uh, Saudis, will suffer because they are buying the loyalty of people by money and the subsidies, and they are not going to be able to do it anymore. And they never took care of all their people because poverty there also is high, the percentage of people who are still poor and who are still uneducated and who are still unqualified to do any job. And this is why they will have problems inside Saudi Arabia, and also they have political problems within the ruling family right now. What will come up uh, come out of Saudi Arabia, I really don't know. I think also that the long-term plan of the American 
establishment, let's put it this way, is to turn Saudi Arabia, just like what they did in Syria, and they did in Libya, and they did in, in Sudan, to turn it into a failed state and, and divide the country. And I think this is probably a little bit long term right now because of the, the virus that uh, delayed almost implementation of these plans. And the administration that we have today does not have a plan, really. It doesn't have a vision to start with. Because to do anything right, you need a vision first for the future. Then you have a plan to translate that vision to reality on the ground. And you have more, two more elements. You have to have also a leadership that people trust. And also you have to have like an organization or a social movement to back that leader. And we don't have it here in the So we don't have any. I mean, the approval or even of the party, the Democrats and Republicans, is so down to the 20%. And in Congress, it's only 9%. So if you look at the, the, what's happening in America, the public opinion, people have more trust in government than they have in the central government in America today. And the whole system, it needs to be restructured. And this is why, when you look at the word, the word that looks to America is making a mistake today. Because America doesn't have a vision or a plan. As far when as... When we come back... Again, Yes, sorry, want... Dr. Rabia. Uh, I uh, need to interrupt you here because we have a commercial break. But when we come back, we will have some concluding questions about the future after the break. مرحبا سعيد اهلا علا ليش هالمقابله الفاتره هي بيقول المثل لاقيني ولا تغديني يما زعلتي شنو رايك اذا لقيتك وايضا غديتك باحسن مطاعم ميشيغان مطعم اشتاق والله فكره افضل الاطباق والمقبلات العربيه والعراقيه واحلى ملقا ولا تنسين اللحوم الطازجه مباشره من ملحمه اشتار لزباين اشتار وملحمه اشتار توفر اختيارات متنوعه من كافه انواع اللحوم وباسعار متميزه وجوده ايضا مميزه مرحمة إشتار تقع على 36865 راين رود في مدينة ستيرلي هاي وأكيد أحلى لمة وأطيب لقمة في مطعم عشتار اللي عنوانه 36253 ماين رود في مدينة ستيرلينج هاي هاتف 586-698-2585 586-698-2585 يلا علا يلا عشتار للجودة وكرم الضيافة عنوان مطعم عشتار مركز طب رهاب للعلاج الطبيعي بإدارة الدكتور محمد فرح حسين أخصائي العلاج الطبيعي بخبرة أكثر من 13 عاما طب رهاب يقدم خدمات العلاج الطبيعي وإعادة التأهيل ويضم مجموعة من أفضل أخصائي التشخيص الدقيق للحالات المرضية مع خبرة عالية في التعامل مع الحالات التي تحتاج إلى إعادة تأهيل وعناية خاصة بعد العمليات والكسور طب رهاب يستقبل كل الحالات المتعلقة بألم الرقبة، الظهر، المفاصل، شلل الوجه، الانزلاق الغضروفي، عرق النساء، الحوادث وإصابات العمل خبيرات في المعالجة النسائية لخصوصية تامة للسيدات عندما تبحثون عن رعاية متميزة اقصدوا طب رهاب للعلاج الطبيعي الواقع على 15001 ماشيغان أفينيو وللمواعيد اتصلوا على 313-846 الأكل الشامي الأصيل فقط بدماس كوزين زروهم على 2884 وشد لك بفارمينتون هالف ولطلباتكم اتصلوا على 248-987-4609 That's 248-987-4609 دمس كوزين and كاتري جبنالكم الشام لعندكم I am Asif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. <laughs> 
I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East, live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK, 690 AM, and WDMV, 700 AM. Welcome back to Radio Baladi. We are discussing the impact of the coronavirus on the economy and on our well-being. Our guests are Mr. Khalil Hashim and Professor Mohammed Rabia. Mr. Hashim, do you see a need for international alliances now to safeguard health security rather than military security? Absolutely. I mean, we're dealing with the unknown. We're dealing with a virus we really don't know, um, you know, we're, we're, what kind of virus it is, how, gonna, how it is going to manifest itself. The, the fear here or the problem here is that 50% of people who contract this virus have no idea that they have it. At the same time, they do infect others. This is the problem. I mean, if this were to be like the SARS, where, where somebody gets it, they get really sick and then either die or get very sick and they know that they got it. Some people get it and they don't really know what to do with it. Our lives are never going to be the same, you know, and uh, uh, everything's going to change. The duration, we have no idea how long it's going to be. Do we need the cooperation? Yes. Is there cooperation? I don't see cooperation. I don't even see co cooperation between states and the federal government. In America, and I don't see that big cooperation between the United States and Europe, and I don't see that big cooperation between, you know, rich country, poor country, and uh, you know, this time we cannot ignore poor countries because if they are infected, they're going to infect us. So this is a worldwide problem. This small virus that we can't see shut down the world, and only the world if they come together, we're, we're, you know, with a, with a good plan how to counter it. Otherwise, we have a big problem. Professor Rabia, as you know, um, people are working from home now. Students are using remote learning. So after the virus is over, why do we need to physically go to work or physically go to school? Well, for, uh, I think, two reasons. Number one is that I don't think all the work could be done from home because you have industries that you have to be on the job and you have farms that you have to be on the job and you have other things that you have to be on the job. And also uh, for students, uh, I believe that learning via the internet is really a tragedy because what you really need to do is to interact with the students being a professor that I taught at 11 different universities on the four continents, including three universities here in, in, in Washington, D.C. So if there is no interaction between students and professors and also outside speakers who come all over the campus to speak, there, was, there will be no real education. Because even students from the Middle East who come and say, I would like to study international relations, and they would like to go and say to far away places, good universities. I say just being in Washington, D.C., you learn much more than going to school in a much like New Mexico, for example. Why? Because here there are so many activities in the city that you can attend, that you learn so much from it, not only from one professor or two professors. So there is a need for the interaction. And also when you talk about this, it is the sad thing in America today that a lot of poor students and poor families have neither computers nor, nor internet connection at their home. Their kids are really missing a lot. And some of them probably will miss it all year because of this, this fact. Again, going to the system that we have today, when the system of government does not really have any reserve for anything, this is what happens today. When you feel you are facing a challenge, you are not ready for it. If we had enough government hospitals, for example, we wouldn't have the situation we are in today. And let me go back to the World Bank and the IMF because it's important for the third world. The World Bank has been in business over 70 years. 
And up till today, it was established to help underdeveloped countries develop. The World Bank, up till today, does not have one single success story to tell. We are unable to help one single country develop and move from the agricultural age to the industrial age. The IMF has not been in any country without destroying their economy. Show me one economy in America and in the, in the whole world that the IMF was able to help. They cannot help. And also the rate of interest they are giving those people are at least 10 times as much as the rate of interest that is charged by the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank. So they are giving them low with a high interest rate that they cannot repay. According to my estimate, my latest book, which was published in the 2018, called The Global Debt Crisis and Its Social Economic Implications. According to my estimate and my work in this one, about 60 countries in the world will never, ever be able to repay their debt, including, of course, the United States, and England, and Germany, and Belgium, and Italy, and Spain, and so many. Not only the poor, also the rich countries. They cannot pay it. And this is, I came myself with a plan how to enable all countries in the world to repay all their debt at, in a single day, in one day, at no cost to any government, to a bank, or to a taxpayer. Even the Federal Reserve Bank, the American Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, posted my plan for about six months and they pulled it out. And I think because banks don't like it, right? But this is the only way. If we do not solve this problem all at once, and everyone be included to be fair, because there are, today, what's happening today? America can print money, or just like issue money, what's happening today, those trillions of dollars that they are given to the people, just like, like printing. And the same thing, Europeans can't do it, but Lebanon cannot do it, or Egypt cannot do it, because the whole thing will go down. The, 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 the value of the lira in Lebanon, the value of the town in Egypt, uh, the Jordan will go down, and there will be inflation. Thank you very much, uh, and I will see you all again the first Friday of next month. Have a good weekend.